gently close your eyes do deep breathing we'll chant om once together synchronize the chanting of om with your exhalation breathe in सहनावतु सहनौ भुनक्तु सह वीर करवाह तेजस्वीनावदी तमस्तु मावह ओ शाति 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 gently open your eyes hari om and a very good day to all of you so last week we uh, started this series on uh, inner strength develop inner strength and take charge of your life now there was a person there is a person who has uh, sent a message and what uh, he said was something very interesting he said the moment he read the title develop inner strength and take charge of your life he said that did something to him it became like a a direct advice for him and he said he kept on reading it over and over again and not only that whenever he got time he just sat and thought about this title develop inner strength and take charge of your life he he says that it was a great meditative experience for him now this is something very interesting i'll tell you the reason why this happened it's not only for him i'm sure many of you when you read that topic even before the previous uh, session when it was announced and when you saw it in facebook or in your uh, whatsapp group or instagram wherever it is you saw it i'm sure uh, that would have given you a lot of strength just reading it there is a reason behind it supposing let us say i had worded it as developing inner strength and taking charge of your life now there is nothing wrong with the topic but it wouldn't have hit you directly the moment it was worded as develop it becomes like a direct message it is a direct message so whenever you relate to something directly that penetrates your mind 
when you relate to something indirectly that does not penetrate your mind this is a simple principle which you need to understand a master a spiritual master how he functions is when it comes to giving out the principles he is very direct he is very forceful so that goes and gets installed in the deeper layers of your mind automatically when it comes to advice there a master is never direct he never gives advice directly he he never tells anyone do this do that you should do this you should do that he doesn't give it like that rather he will always be suggestive he'll say if you take this up this will be the result if you take this up this will be the result and you will have to decide so this is the same formula which you need to follow this is what has been given by our yogis you see any siddha any yogi any master when it comes to principles he or she would have been very direct so in life what you do is that generally when it comes to principles it is all very hazy for you you are never sharp and direct this is what is right this is what is wrong you don't uh, have that clarity whereas when it comes to advising others you are very direct remember when you give a direct advice to someone that will not have that impact because you are not giving the other person the freedom to function you are interfering in the other person's karmas when it is suggestive you are giving a lot of um things for the other person to think and then the freedom is also there for him or her to decide as a human being you have this choice of action this freedom in the last uh, uh discourse i had mentioned the greatest sin is in curbing the other person's freedom so many people tell me that sir my children are not listening to me my um, spouse is not listening to me nobody is listening to me that is because you employ this wrong approach see when you speak it needs to have power when will your speech get that power if you follow the simple principle of course there are uh, so many other principles like pran shakti behind what you say your uh, bhavana so many things are there but this is this would be a very very useful tip for you all so generally when it comes to principles you compromise it's all very hazy you're not crisp and clear you know every time we uh, make a mistake when i say mistake i mean mistake according to our, us our own conscience um, will tell us this is a mistake every time we commit a mistake we always tend to justify we tend to uh you know talk in a very generalized way if it is wrong means it is wrong if it is right means it is right with respect to yourself you need to learn that sharpness and when it comes to advising others be suggestive this will this uh, approach will give you a lot of strength in your life it 
you you will find uh, your communication abilities will start improving not only your external communication but your internal communication what you communicate to yourself that will also start becoming very powerful so if you go to the bhagavad gita krishna is very very forceful and direct when it comes to principles in the second chapter towards the end he says this is the state of brahman this is the state of infinite because he was uh, the incarnation of the infinite so very authoritatively very very clearly in a sharp way he says this is the state of the highest the infinite have no doubts about that but when it comes to personal advice when arjuna asks him should i fight or not fight krishna doesn't tell him directly in the third chapter arjuna asks this should i fight or should i gain knowledge tell me clearly decide and tell me one thing he says but krishna does not tell him directly he repeats the same question in the fourth chapter arjuna because he is not getting a direct answer but uh, it takes a while for him to understand that a master does not function that way and having said all that he has to say when it came to the final advice he said yatha ichasi tatha kuru do whatever you uh, like to do arjuna decide with the uh, uh, knowledge and wisdom which i have given you you decide clearly and then take your course of action so why is it that parents complain children are not listening to me because you go on directly advice and when it comes to principles you have no answers supposing a child questions why should uh, i go and uh, light a lamp one uh, young one child ask the mother you know why are you lighting the lamp in the puja room every day god you yourself say that god is present everywhere and why should you light a lamp the mother had no answer principles it was not clear but when it comes to direct when it comes to advice you know you are always very very sharp and direct so reverse this process you will find a tremendous difference in your life because when you are very clear crystal clear about the principles which you need to follow in life that will give you immense inner strength we'll be seeing that in more detail today we'll be starting the i'll pick up one of the verses from the bhagavad gita and we'll go deep into it but the basic principle is this if you are very clear about your principles you will be a very strong person but if your principles are hazy you will lose your inner strength and whenever you are suggestive in life when it comes to giving advice to others first of all no necessity to give advice to others the others have to seek your advice you should not go and trust yourself upon others and even when advice is sought never be direct always be suggestive like many people come and ask me you know sir should i do this or that i said that i always say that is for you to decide should i take up this job or should i take up that job that only you have to decide but i can give you that wisdom that clarity with which you will be able to come to a firm decision should i marry this person or that person it is you who need to decide you have to choose in your life 
you cannot delegate that responsibility to the teacher last week i was telling you the combination of surrender and effort so surrender is of the ego to get connected with the infinite but effort you need to put in and when we say effort effort intellectual effort to decide emotional effort to build positive emotions effort you know in speaking positively every in every aspect you should be dynamic and put in that effort so generally there is a tendency to um you know go to a guru and then you say sir can you uh sit in meditation and then you know i i am telling you my problem can you just sit in meditation and tell give me a solution that is not the work of a master the master gives you that wisdom with which you will be able to decide yes if you are unable to decide you can always uh seek clarification you can uh, gain more clarity by asking but you will have to live your life because the moment the master says do this do that now you will stop thinking so when krishna uh, when arjuna asks krishna you know tell me ekam vad tadekam nischit uh, nischitya he says decide and tell me one thing krishna should i act or should i gain knowledge now krishna does not give him a direct answer is loke smin vivida nishta means in this world there are two there is a two fold path he says for the contemplative people i have given jnana yoga for the active people i have given karma yoga now you have to choose what you need to do you know uh, what what should be the proportion how much of knowledge you need to gain how much of action you need to get in all that is your homework arjuna i'll give you that wisdom this is a strong message so when the title was put as develop inner strength it is a direct message and it's a beautiful thing that this person has shared you know which others can also try it just read the title and then sit with your eyes closed and do some deep breathing meditate on it just for 5 minutes and see by soaking yourself on these direct messages by soaking your mind on these direct messages your inspiration will grow your inner strength will grow your consciousness will start rising and then simultaneously put in the effort put in the effort to act to speak properly to act properly to feel positively to decide things with clarity if it's a very major decision it's wise to consult um, a higher intellect uh, your uh, master to ensure that yes you're on the right track i i understand that but that should not be a substitute for your effort remember this this is one thing the other thing is several people had uh, sent mails saying that uh, you know last week when i had uh, casually given out certain points like when i said krishna uh, and arjuna arjuna represents the worldly potential in you and krishna represents the spiritual potential in you similarly yada yada hi dharmasya that was i i gave a subtle point so what uh, many people were saying is that we have been attending the bhagavad gita uh, right from 2014 the yogic approach but the moment you said arjuna represents the worldly potential and krishna represents the spiritual potential it was something very unique 
because you had never mentioned it in that way earlier. Similarly, I was telling you about the, when I was answering that question, you know, when you meditate, how the karmas come to the surface, but you need to release them. So, many people had uh, uh, said that, that hit them. So, there was one person who had asked a direct question saying that, Sir, why didn't you say this before? Arjuna represents your worldly potential within you and Krishna represents the spiritual potential. I heard earlier you said Arjuna represents the Jivatma, the individual soul, Krishna represents the Paramatma, so many other things I had heard. But this one, this phrase, why you didn't mention earlier, it was so powerful. Now, what I want to tell you all is that, see if you take a scripture like the Bhagavad Gita, it is a multi-dimensional text. You are so used to living life in a unidimensional way. But actually life itself is multidimensional. You, you, you are a multidimensional being. So if you take the Bhagavad Gita, there are infinite dimensions to it. If you just give me one verse, let us say the very first verse, Dhritarashtra Vacha, Dharma Kshetre, Kuru Kshetre. You know that verse if you take. And if you ask me to give a discourse every day on it for next one year. Every day just that one verse. Now you will be very surprised. Because every day I will go on giving new new dimensions, new new points. There was one uh, sadhak who had uh, attended many of my discourses and she was saying she used, she was writing down notes. She said on 12 different contexts, I had given 12 different dimensions or 12 different uh, meanings to that word objectivity. She showed me all that. Even I was very surprised because you know, as you know, when I given, when I come and talk, um, I don't plan or uh, program it. I just get connected to the infinite and it's like, a, it's out of inspiration. It just flows, you know, that I just flow with the energy. Like how, uh, you know, a bird, uh, a nightingale sings. It will not plan. When it gets inspired, automatically the song will come, come out, you know. It's like that. So when she showed me that, oh, I said, so much has been said, is it? She said, sir, I want to remind you, you only said that. I said, I, no, it is a higher inspiration. So this text itself is a multidimensional text. So the same verses I may take in different contexts, what will come out will be something totally different. This is something which you need to remember. Never fix your mind with one thing and think that, yes, now I have understood. Someone asked me long back, Sir, how is it that you, uh, you are taking the same thing, the Bhagavad Gita, few other scriptures also, you are taking the same thing, don't you ever get bored? It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. My answer is no, I never get bored. Because each time I look at this, uh, for example, the Bhagavad Gita, something new comes out of it. So if you also build that approach, See, one is the intellectual approach. You just write down the notes, the points and say, ah, now I have understood. The other is the yogic approach, which is what we are taking. So every time is a new session for you. It, it may be the same verse, the verses which I am going to take, 
in this series um many of you would have already attended that in the uh, chapter 1 the discourse series but no every time you read that it will give you a new message because it has infinite dimensions and what is interesting is if you practice this approach here now slowly slowly you will learn to live your whole life in a multidimensional way every experience in life will become a new experience for you every day when you wake up it will be a new day for you every time you meet the same person you will not say it is the same person no is there something it's a new experience a fresh experience that's why one great thinker uh, a tamil siddhar he said indru dan pirandom endru ninai means think that you were born today we have our birthdays no so this date i was born this year you say this great siddha said no think that you are born right now we'll go even step one step further not only today right now this experience you are fresh you are born in a fresh way and when this experience is over you will go to the next experience again you are born this is a very very powerful principle which these great masters have given and if you can absorb this you will find you will always be replenishing yourself with tremendous inner energy and strength that monotony will never set in you will never get bored with life especially during this lockdown period a common thing which i am hearing is i am getting bored people are saying so you are trying to find out new new things in order to keep yourself occupied a yogi does not need extraordinary experiences in life every ordinary experience in life he makes it extraordinary by having this approach he does not require special experiences to be happy normal experiences he will be able to eke out infinite happiness from that so same thing with these verses also if you merely have an intellectual approach now when am i going to finish this i have finished this verse now i'll move to the next verse it will be like that but develop this yogic approach practice it here and then extend it to every aspect of your life supposing somebody near and dear to you suddenly behaves in a different way than what he or she used to behave every day now that is something new you may uh, judge and say this is negative this is positive but instead of judging now why don't you take it as a fresh experience every day when you see the sunrise when you see the sunset it's a new day it's a new experience and if you keep on practicing this you will grow spiritually and a time would come where your normal process of breathing will become extraordinary to you every time you inhale it is a fresh breath pran shakti which you are taking in and every time you exhale it is a fresh exhalation lord buddha he practiced this meditation and he used to suggest it suggest this to many of his disciples it's an ancient yogic technique he said keep on observing your breath you have to first develop this yogic approach in order to practice that otherwise you will feel it monotonous 
See, so many experiences you are getting in life, if that itself is boring for you, just sitting and observing your breath, you know, inhalation, exhalation, inhalation, it will become too boring for you. But if you develop this yogic approach, every time you breathe in, it will give you that freshness. And every time you breathe out, all your negativity will go out. And that freshness will get spread in each and every cell of your body. That's what I'm making you practice a little bit in the meditation sessions which we have. I always say, you know, take in the divine energy when you're breathing in. And then as you breathe out, let it spread to each and every cell of your body. That will energize you, that will give you immense strength. So the topic is inner strength. And when your um, approach in life is mechanical, you will lose the strength and vigor. The moment you say, I am bored, it means you lost your strength because boredom will actually make you weak. You see the animals, you see the birds. Has a bird ever got bored? Has an animal ever got bored? And if you see a squirrel, the squirrel is constantly doing something, looking here, looking there, doing something. If you go and ask the squirrel, now what is your purpose, what is your goal and all that, it will not know. But so much of energy and enthusiasm a squirrel has. A crow, you know, if one crow shouts, now every crow in the vicinity comes and they all together start um, crowing. From where is that energy coming? Because every animal, every creature takes each and every experience in life as it is, as if it's the first time, a fresh beginning. It is only the human being who messes the whole thing. So the same verses we'll be doing, but this time the context is going to be inner strength and taking charge of your life. Develop inner strength and take charge of your life. That is the context. So you will find new, new dimensions coming from the same verses which you would have heard before. Supposing we fix the reference point as, instead of inner strength as happiness, then something totally new will come up. So practice it right from here. Okay? With that, we'll get on with the uh, verses. Now, a little bit of the background of the Bhagavad Gita, you all know, the Bhagavad Gita was given in the battlefield of Kurukshetra. And the very theme of Bhagavad Gita is inner strength only, how to develop inner strength. Because Arjuna, in spite of having tremendous technical knowledge, he was the greatest archer of his time, the greatest warrior. In spite of that, when a challenge came, he was unable to confront the challenge. He lost his inner strength. And his life went out of his control. He, he himself says that in the first chapter. He says, I am unable to hold the Gandiva. Gandiva is his uh, bow, you know. That is his weapon. Uh, the divine bow. He says, that is slipping from my hands. Means, even that control he didn't have. He completely loses control. Why? Because he loses the inner strength. And then, Lord Krishna gave him the Gita and Arjuna regained his inner strength and the moment he got back the strength, then his whole life came back under his control again. This is the very theme, the background of the Bhagavad Gita. So it was given in the battlefield of Kurukshetra and the battle was fought primarily between 
the pandavas and the kauravas the kauravas are the evil forces the pandavas are the good people this is always the theme of any story even in the today's movies you see there'll always be a good person there'll always be a bad person and uh, you know fight between those two this is a this is a theme why you may ask me why because that is how life is life is made up of positives and negatives and there is always a tussle between the positives and negatives externally and internally there is always righteousness and unrighteousness outside same way there are negative forces and positive forces within you so in the yogic approach we are interested in perfecting ourselves so we'll be seeing the application of this wisdom with respect to purifying oneself internally and rising to higher levels of perfection so the pandavas represent the positive forces within you the positive thinking positive emotions every aspect which is positive and the kauravas represent the negative forces within you so instead of seeing the uh, reading the mahabharat the uh, the war situation everything is something outside that is no doubt a starting point now in the yogic approach you need to internalize it and only when you internalize it and absorb the deeper messages that will give you that inner strength when you merely read it as a story or you read it as an external philosophy when you read the bhagavad gita as an external philosophy that will not give you the inner strength i know many people who can uh, who have by hearted the bhagavad gita and who can repeat you know who can just chant some people i know who can chant forwards and backwards also the reverse direction amazing talent and many people have been reading the bhagavad gita the philosophy part for many many years but i found that a slightest thing goes wrong outside a small challenge confronts them immediately they they collapse they get disturbed why is that because all along you are externalizing the philosophy you are reading it outside so now take the yogic approach the battle which they are talking about is the battle of life is your own inner battle the pandavas are the positive forces within you the kauravas are the negative forces and they are constantly fighting against each other there is an eternal inner conflict in you between the good and the bad duryodhana is also within you yudhishthira is also within you arjuna is also within you lord krishna is also within you everything which is happening in the war is actually happening within you so the first step in building inner strength is to develop this approach that is learning to internalize this wisdom not study it merely externally when you study it externally you will be more interested in covering a lot of information first chapter second chapter third chapter for you your whole focus will be on that but if you internalize it your focus will be will not be on how many chapters i have covered or how many verses i have covered your focus will be on what is happening inside how many negativities have i conquered how much how many positive things the positive qualities have i installed within my system that will be your focus so what happened 
was that the story part is the uh, the pandavas were good people but they were very passive in life so they suffered they were sent to the forest 12 for uh, 13 years 12 years they had to be in the forest 13th year uh, they had to be live incognito and all that you know by the kauravas and they fulfilled all the conditions and they came back but they were not given their rightful kingdom therefore they waged this war and it was a world war because many people lot of people joined the kaurava forces lot of kings supported the pandavas so the whole world was divided into two the righteous people and unrighteous people this is how vyasa has depicted and krishna was a key person there even though he didn't actually fight in the war he was the one who masterminded the whole thing for the pandavas because his role was to resurrect righteousness that is the role of any master to resurrect righteousness so just before the battle was about to begin the both the forces had assembled and the story is that this whatever was happening in the battle was being reported by uh, sanjaya to dhritarashtra who was sitting elsewhere the, the story is that vyasa gave the divine eyes with which he was able to view what was happening in the battlefield and he was reporting that to dhritarashtra the father of the kauravas and in the first verse dhritarashtra asked this question so what did these people what are they doing what did they do in the battlefield and then sanjaya starts reporting so what is the first thing which he says he says duryodhana he approached his teacher drona and he said i will uh, tell you who are all there in the opposite camp and who are there in our camp and he mentioned a few great heroes in the pant from the pandava camp they are all added there and then he said uh, now i will tell you who are all present in our camp this is how it starts and then after he finishes that they all blow the conches and then arjuna and krishna get into the picture their focus goes on to them because they are the main people and how arjuna sees the challenge in front of him and he uh, starts collapsing and then krishna gives him the gita that high that uh, higher wisdom and which it, uh, through which he builds that inner strength and gets back to fight so the bhagavad gita starts with dhritarashtra asking that question to sanjaya so sanjaya is that uh, capacity in you to internalize it objectively because he saw everything see the whole battle was happening outside but where was sanjaya seeing it he was seeing it in his mind sitting elsewhere it's a very very symbolic message which they are giving the battle is happening outside but he was seeing the battle inside himself with the divine eyes and he was reporting it to dhritarashtra this is the yogic approach i am referring to so your whole life is happening outside the battle represents life but you should become sanjaya you should develop that divine eyes the yogic vision in life and see the whole thing happening inside you 
This is what the great Tamil Siddhar, one, one Siddha, he said, Andatil Vullade Pindatil. What is happening in the Brahman and the cosmos is actually happening within you. It's a yogic approach. So, in verse, up to verse number 7, what uh, Duryodhana does is, he recounts, after the Dhritarashtra asked and Sanjaya starts saying, Duryodhana goes to the teacher, Drona, and he says, these people are there in the Pandava camp. And then he says, now, O oh teacher, I will tell you who are all arrayed in our side. That I will tell you. And then we go to verse number 8. So, I have taken verse number 8. See, as I told you, every verse I can take, but I am just selecting a, a few here and there, uh, which will uh, be directly useful to you in this context. Okay? So, we will go to verse number 8 of chapter 1. I will uh, chant it twice. That is, I will chant it once and I will repeat it again. And those of you who would like to chant along with me, when I chant second time, you can always do so. Okay? Bhavan Bhishmascha Karnascha Kripascha Samitinjaya Ashvatthama Vikarnascha Saumadattista Thaivacha Together Bhavan Bhishmascha Karnascha Kripascha Samitinjaya Ashvatthama Vikarnascha Saumadattista so, verse number 8. So, in the previous verse, Duryodhana said, Now I am going to tell you who are all there in our side, that is, in the Kaurava side. Bhavan means thyself. Thyself means he is referring to Drona because he is talking to Drona, his own teacher. So, thyself, Bhavan. Bhishma cha and Bhishma. Bhishma was the great grandfather. He was a elder, one of the oldest in the Kuru clan. Very, very powerful character. So Drona was also very powerful. So thyself and Bhishma. I'm first translating, then we'll get to the Deeper meaning. Karna Hacha and Karna. Karna was actually the eldest Pandava, but he didn't know that. So he was siding with the Kauravas, with Duryodhana. He was an extremely powerful person. He was equal to Arjuna in terms of archery. Sometimes they, it has even been mentioned that he was uh, one step even better in the skill, you know, than Arjuna also. So powerful he was, Karna. Then Kripahacha, Kripacharya, he was the Kula Guru, the official priest there for the Kauravas. Samitinjaya means victorious in battle, who are victorious in battle. So, these people had that reputation. They were victorious in battle, Samitinjaya. And then he continues, Ashwatthama. He was a son of Drona, a Chiranjivi, one who will never die for the entire Kalpa. That's how it's been described, you know. Vikarna, Vikarna Hacha. Vikarna. Vikarna was one of the hundred brothers. You know, Kauravas were hundred in number. The Pandavas were only five brothers. So, one of the brothers was Vikarna. And then he says, Saumadattihi, the son of Somadatta. Saumadattihi, was a son of 
Somadatta. Now, who he is, all that we'll see. So, basically, he is just listing out a few powerful warriors. Daisal, that is Drona, then Bhishma, then Karna, Kripa, Ashwatthama, Vikarna and Saumadatti. And then, of course, he'll continue further. Now, I have chosen this verse for a specific reason because it gives you very, very powerful messages in the context of inner strength and taking charge of your life. Now, each character he is mentioning, for example, let us take Drona, Bhishma and Karna. They, these three are the first three whom he is mentioning. Now, these three characters, if you take in the Mahabharata, they were very, very powerful characters. They were not ordinary people. If you take Bhishma, the very word Bhishma means terrible. He was trained in all aspects of life by the best gurus in that field. Warfare and all that he learned from Parashrama. That is why Drona, um, uh, uh, Bhishma was called invincible. And he had that boon. He could choose his own death, Icha Amrityu. He could decide when he wanted to die. Such a powerful person, Bhishma. Drona. Drona was a uh, teacher of uh, Arjuna and all the, the Pandavas and the Kauravas. He was also trained by Parashurama only. If what is interesting is uh, Bhishma, Drona and Karna were all disciples of Parashurama, who was an avatar, you know. So Arjuna learnt everything only from Drona. So he was also invincible. You cannot, you cannot defeat Bhishma, you cannot defeat Drona. And then Karna. He was so powerful. He was a son of uh, the sun god, full of the, uh, the uh, Tejas, you know, that's the, the Surya Teja, as they call it. He was extremely powerful. Actually, Duryodhana made friends with Karna because when he saw Karna, he saw his potential. He knew that if Karna was with him, he had a chance to defeat the Pandavas because Arjuna is there on the other side. Duryodhana's friendship with Karna was not unconditional. It is mentioned in the um, Mahabharata. There was a inner motive and that motive was that he want he he recognized Karna as a potent force who could uh, be you know who could defeat Arjuna, who had the potential. So so powerful. That is why Duryodhana is mentioning these three names first. Now, if you take these three characters, they are so powerful people. But if you read their life history, you will find them powerless in life. It's so beautifully portrayed in the Mahabharata. You know, imagine a person like Bhishma who had Icha Mrityu, you know, who could die whenever he wanted to die. Drona, the past master in all in, the, in archery and all the weapons. And Karna, who had who was one of the greatest archers of his time. With these kind of people, they had everything with them, but entire Mahabharata 
you will find that these three people were always grumbling because their life was not under their control. It is very, very interesting how Vyasa has portrayed. For some of you who attended the same verse um, when I took chapter 1, I don't remember, I may not have mentioned this point, but that context was different. The same Bhishma, Drona, Karna, we saw even during the Gita Dhyanam, the, inter, the um, introduction to the Bhagavad Gita, you know, uh, that went on for almost 10 lectures, how, what they represent within you and how you can conquer them and all that we saw. In this context, this is another dimension I am giving you. That is, these people were so great, so skillful, they had immense talent. The whole world stood in awe over these people's achievements, like Bhishma and Drona and Karna. But if you go and go a little deeper, and read their characters, you will find that none of them were happy. Bhishma was eternally complaining, always. Because, I will tell you the reason, Drona, he was also always complaining. Karna, he was never happy. Why? In spite of having so much of skill, so much of valor, why is it that their lives were not under their control? It is because they got united themselves with Duryodhana. Duryodhana represents the ego within you. You may have a lot of valor in life. You may have wonderful skills. But if you go and get united with your ego, then you will lose control over your own life. When Draupadi was disrobed in the court, Draupadi was the wife of the Pandavas. She was a queen. And um, um, Duryodhana ordered his younger brother Dushasana to go come out to bring her, pull her and uh, violently and disrobe her in front of everyone. Dhritarashtra was also there. And so much of injustice was happening. You know, uh, the a lady was, uh, you know, the modesty of a lady was uh, going away. When that was happening, these great stalwarts like Bhishma, Drona and Karna, they couldn't do anything. They were all good people actually, noble people. But they had some terrible weaknesses also. That is why they had to suffer. And the main thing was, they got bound by Duryodhana, with Duryodhana. They developed a bondage with Duryodhana. Duryodhana was controlling them. They had no power to act beyond what Duryodhana was deciding. Bhishma really didn't want to fight this battle. Drona didn't want to fight this battle. The most interesting part is, Karna just before the battle started, um, uh, Krishna went and told him that you are the eldest Pandava, you didn't, you don't know that. After that, Karna also didn't want to fight the battle. But yet, all of them fought and they died. They knew that they were going to die because Krishna and Arjuna were on the other side. Where, where Krishna is, righteousness, the Dharma is there and that Dharma is going to protect. Knowing very well that they are going to die, they still went and fought and died. Knowing very well that what Duryodhana was doing was wrong, 
they still supported him they didn't have that strength to say what you're doing is wrong i will we will not support you they couldn't do that that is the weakness so bhishma drona and karna fighting in the side of unrighteousness this is something which is mind boggling many people ask these people are so good then why are they siding unrighteousness because they got themselves bound by uh, bound with duryodhana it's a very very symbolic uh thing which vyasa is giving the tip for the sadaks you you may have wonderful skills and valor and you may be very very multi talented but if you get yourself bound with your ego if you join with your join hands with your ego now that will suck away all the goodness from you and all your skill your valor everything will go waste you will lose your inner strength in life and you will lose your control in life how many times in the mahabharat bhishma keeps saying this you know bhishma and drona have conversations in there are many portions and they keep on talking about what is going wrong how duryodhana is being so unrighteous and then bhishma says the sad thing is in spite of being bhishma in spite of uh, having so much of skills i am unable to do anything he cries in many portions same thing drona also says i am dronacharya i am the teacher but yet i am unable to do anything karna he never felt his life was under his control you know when uh, karna died just before he died uh there is a conversation between krishna and karna it's a beautiful conversation so there karna criticizes arjuna uh i am not going getting into the full story but uh, he says arjuna whatever you did is wrong and then krishna comes in and says karna what have you been doing your entire life you went and joined hands you went and jo- uh, joined hands with duryodhana and then you started supporting everything which duryodhana did when draupadi was disrobed why didn't you stop him to which karna says krishna you are one person whom i thought understood me fully i knew that was wrong whatever was done to draupadi was wrong but you know as a friend of duryodhana i had to please him you know he uh, passed a very negative comment about uh, draupadi in the court in the in front of everyone and that is why arjuna took that oath that day that i will kill karna so he a, he justified that act he tried to justify by saying that i had to please duryodhana to which krishna t- uh, told him listen karna if you were a true friend of duryodhana what should you have done what he is doing is wrong you should have corrected him because if you had told him there was a good chance that duryodhana would have listened but you were unable to do so you didn't do that the question is why because he had sold his conscience to the negative to the ego all of them so the ego has been portrayed in all the scriptures as negative in every religion if you take the puranic stories the ego has been portrayed as the asuras the the the, the demons you know if you go to christianity 
the ego has been portrayed as Satan. Satan and you have Father in heaven. Satan is not outside. Satan is inside you only. Your own ego is your Satan. If you take Islam, they call it Shaitan. Shaitan and God. Again, it is the ego. If you take Buddhism, they call it Mara. Mara means the devil, the ego, which is there within you. If you take the Mahabharata, Duryodhana represents the ego. So it is not enough if you have skill in life. It is not enough if you are good in life to start with. But if you start feeding your ego, if you join hands with your ego, slowly, slowly, all your goodness will be taken away from you. That's why in the text Gita Dhyanam, uh, Duryodhana is, um, you know, compared to that whirlpool which sucks away, which sucks you in. What, what does it mean? The ego sucks away all your goodness. You have to be very careful. Then all the skill and talents which you have, you will be using it not for a good purpose. And once you become a slave of your own ego, thereafter you will have no freedom to function. Your life will go out of your control. So the mistake, the fundamental mistake which these three people made was that they didn't act according to their conscience. In different places in the Mahabharata, Bhishma, Drona and Karna exhibited so much of nobility. They were noble people. And openly they did, you know, there are conversations where they say what Duryodhana is doing is wrong. Their conscience clearly told them that this is wrong. But they didn't follow the conscience. Some reason they were giving. The Bhishma said, that is because I took an oath that I will protect the king who sits on the throne. Drona said, um, I am, you know, uh, I uh, taught uh, uh, archery and other weaponry to the princess. So I am bound, I have duty towards the kingdom. Actually, he had no duty. Karna said, uh, Duryodhana is my dearest friend, so I have a duty towards my friend. These were all justifications which they were giving. Why I am saying justification is, the mind always gives justification in order to move away from the conscience. You should remember this. Your conscience clearly tells you what you should do. But your mind does not want to do it. The conscience tells you what is right, what is wrong in life. It could be a very, very a small experience, you know, your early morning. Let's say you decide, I want to get up and do exercises. Now your conscience clearly tells you, you have to wake up, do your exercises, do your sadhana. But your mind will not want to do that. And the ego will prompt the mind to give various justifications. Oh, I slept very late yesterday and you know, uh, um, everybody requires so many hours of sleep. All these calculations, you will become great mathematicians only early in the morning. So you start giving so many justifications why you should not do that. That is what is so beautifully seen, I mean, so beautifully explained by Vyasa. So, if you want to build inner strength in your life, it is not enough if you have skill and it, it's not enough if you are passively good and all that. No. 
one of the most important thing is you should start following your conscience if see you you do you have a choice either you follow your conscience or you follow your ego choice is yours and those who follow the conscience will evolve will rise to higher levels of perfection and those who feed their own ego will devolve those who follow their conscience they they will find that their inner strength will keep on increasing and their entire life will come under their control whereas a person who follows the ego feeds the ego initially it will be very pleasing and nice but slowly slowly all his inner strength and powers will go away and lot of stress will uh, take over such a person will become very highly stressed and entire life will go out of his or her control so that is why very very powerful characters have been created noble people but they are siding duryodhana they didn't follow their conscience as shakespeare said you know to thy own self be true and it must follow as night the day thou canst not then be false to any other man so to thy own self you should be true this is very important for every sadhak because when you don't follow your conscience and then when you try and sit and meditate all the mistakes which you did everything will come satyam life of satyam means satyam means not mechanically talking the truth some people interpret it very superficially and in a very limited way it's not that satyam means living a life according to your conscience and your conscience at every moment keeps telling you what is right and what is wrong but the ego tries to influence your mind and your logic logical mind which is the intellect and it tries to weave a lot of justifications why you should not follow that so instead of reading these as mere characters in the story now apply it within yourself start following your conscience from this moment that is the sadhana we will uh, continue further next week we'll go into more depth with respect to the in developing uh, inner strength and taking charge of your life i'll be taking uh, a few verses uh, which generally uh, nobody takes because these things they just pass off like stories you know but uh, they have so much of uh, messages so now uh, we will do uh, meditation i know there are a uh, lot of questions which people have been asking i will take them up uh one by one during the discourses today i had uh, taken up uh, two questions i started with that only uh, so i am not taking any further questions today but next week again one or two i'll take because some of these questions have been uh, quite uh, deep so it takes a little while to answer that and some questions i may not directly take it here read it and uh, sh- uh, answer it uh, some qu- certain question i may not answer them like that but you will find the answers coming during the course of the discourse so now we'll do meditation whatever we had learnt today we will install it in our deeper minds this meditation uh the technique 
which is being used is a combination of dhyana that is meditation and nididhyasana which is uh, installing the qualities in the deeper layers of the mind okay Sit with your spine straight. Gently close your eyes. do deep breathing deep inhalation complete exhalation when you breathe in feel that this is your first breath which you are taking in as if you are born just now and when you breathe out feel that this is your last breath so breathe out fully and completely and then again when you breathe in you are born again it's a fresh experience for you I am that infinite being that supreme consciousness
I have infinite powers, infinite strength within me. As you breathe in, feel the energy of inner strength, a lot of strength is entering you and as you breathe out, the energy of strength is spread to each and every cell of your body. With every breath, I am becoming more and more strong from within. That supreme power is within me. I derive infinite strength from the infinite power which is within me.
this moment onwards i choose to follow my conscience the conscience in me clearly tells me what is right and what is wrong i exercise my choice of action and i choose to follow my conscience at all times offer your gratitude to god supreme offer your gratitude to your guru and all the holy masters slowly come back let your consciousness come back slowly 
gently wriggle your fingers your toes open and close your palms a few times rub your palms together to create a warmth and cup your eyes with your palms gently rub your eyes your cheeks forehead top of the head back of the head and neck very slowly open your eyes Welcome back. So we had a good session today. There are a lot of uh, points which have been given. So you need to reflect on these points and make them a part of your life start doing sadhana with them it is not enough if you are merely intellectually interested in the subject or if you are a mere devotee of god that is not enough you have to become a sadhak you have to internalize this entire wisdom and create a complete transformation within yourself that is why i am having the series and uh, all these are going to be there online so you watch them how many ever times you want and each time you watch as i told you practice this watch it in a fresh way you will find that something new will go on striking you it's very very interesting experience that practice and experience it then that wisdom will become permanent no need to accept because i am saying you experience it for yourself okay so thank you very much we'll see next week thank you